So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. You know, when it comes to your health, I believe that knowledge is power. And every day I get questions about how to live a healthier, happier life. You know, it's important for me, for you to get the tools and knowledge you need to make it a reality for yourself, your family, and even our community and your community. So today, I'm gonna to answer a few questions people have asked me about my new book, The Longevity Paradox, on my social media channels, like my Instagram page at Dr. Stephen Gundry. By the way, a big thank you to each and every one of you that actually participated in asking a question. You know, we actually had an amazing response. It's, uh, and I read every one of them and hopefully, we'll get to a whole bunch of them. So if I didn't get to you this time, it doesn't mean it wasn't important and it doesn't mean I didn't read it because I read every one of them and there were a lot. So uh, I'll try to get as many as we can do. On that note, let's get started to cover as much ground as possible. So we'll start with a question from Nikki New PS. If you have an autoimmune condition, should you follow the plant paradox or the longevity paradox diet? That's a great question. So the, they're actually equally as effective for autoimmune disease, but I think it's far more important, particularly in calming down the autoimmune condition, to really start with the plant paradox and go through the phases uh, properly. The longevity paradox is really, okay, now that you've got the plant paradox figured out, You've got the essentials. Okay, now how do we translate this into dying young at a ripe old age? But the first thing you've got to do and I've got to do is get your autoimmune disease in remission. And the good news is most people who follow this program go into remission. And that's the exciting news. Okay, next question is from Mike Doc McGinnis. Do you recommend any modifications for athletes and are those trying to build muscle? Uh, another great question. Number one, you do not have to make any modifications if you're trying to build muscle. If you do want to increase protein, I have no problem with that if you're actively trying to build muscle. My personal feeling is you'll get just as much benefit by adding a plant protein like hemp, for instance, uh, as adding an animal protein. And depending on how young you are, you're going to be able to, for lack of a better word, get away with more animal protein. If I have my druthers in animal proteins. I'd much rather you get proteins from pastured or omega-3 eggs or from wild fish and wild shellfish. And let me just give a quick proviso. Tuna is not a great source of animal protein for anybody, particularly sashimi grade tuna. If you wanna use the tuna in cans, it's actually from small tuna and doesn't have a lot of mercury. Most of the people that I see with high mercury levels in my practice are either big time sashimi or sushi eaters or dentists. And it's obvious why a lot of dentists have high mercuries. Now, here's an interesting one. Tatian Petruzzi wrote in and asked, the longevity paradox states the importance of living in sync with seasonal shifts. How about the people that live in tropical areas? We have year-round availability to many fruits and vegetables, even if we're eating locally grown produce. How do we have cyclical microbiomes? Excellent question. And what most of us have to realize that even in tropical climates, initially, traditionally, plants only produced fruit once a year in cyclical periods of time. Modern plants have been hybridized, even in the tropics, to produce fruit over a much longer period of time. That doesn't make it natural. I mean, here in Southern California, we can grow strawberries 365 days a year. 
These are frankenberries, quite frankly. They will ripen, have sweetness, without actually even getting red. And that doesn't mean that they're grown, they're grown locally, they're available. That doesn't mean we should be eating them. Strawberries, we should be only be eating in the true summer. Just like an apple, we can have apples grow nearly year round. I have apples that are in my backyard that are producing full apples right now and it's May. That's bizarre, but it's been bred to do that. So even in tropical climates, you have to realize that almost everything that you're getting, even growing naturally, has been hybridized over the last 50, 100 years. So you gotta be very careful with even in the tropical climates. So let me, give you, let me give you an example about eating in a tropical climate. The last remaining hunter-gatherers live in tropical climates. And even studying those people, we know that out in the bush, there are only certain times of the year that fruit and honey is available and other times of the year, it's never available, and they actually switch from a very animal-centric diet to a very fruit and honey-centric diet. And their microbiome switches dramatically in those swings. And I think, and there's evidence to suggest this, that this swing in the microbiome, this change in diversity of the microbiome, may be one of the factors that contributes to longevity. Certainly, up until 100 years ago, we had huge shifts in our diet from fruits that were available to no fruits available. So if you're living in places where year-round fruit is available, the easiest way to do that is, okay, I'm going to choose three months where I'm going to eat fruit and the other nine months I'm not going to. And you choose your three months, and that makes it easy. Uh, Cat J7 asked, it seems many brands are coming out with cheese, yogurt, and milk from grass-fed cows. Is that automatically compliant? I'm concerned for hidden or misleading ingredients. So there are a lot of grass-fed products that are coming out. Unfortunately, most of the animals in the United States, the cows are Holstein, which have casein A1. Jerseys have a mixture of casein A1 and casein A2. Guernsey cows and Swiss browns are A2, and there are still some herds of Guernsey. In fact, if you look for ice cream makers, you'll usually find Guernsey cows because Guernseys have a lot more fat in their milk than the other cows, and that's prized in ice cream makers. In fact, that's where I started to find A2 cow milk herds by tracing down ice cream makers. So having said that, just because it's grass-fed doesn't mean it's not gonna have casein A1 as its primary protein. So do your homework. If you have to, call the company, call the farmer, and find out where it came from. The good news is the vast majority of cows in France, Italy, and Switzerland are A2 cows. The other great news is that goats, sheep, and water buffalo are all A2, so that those cheeses are perfectly safe. In fact, I had some, I was in New York City and I went to my favorite Italian restaurant and they had buffalo mozzarella imported from Italy. And I knew it was safe, so I had it. So there you go. So next, I'll answer a question from Khan Limay. She wrote in and said, your supplement list doesn't include calcium. My mother had osteoporosis, and I'm wondering what someone concerned with bone health should be supplementing. So believe it or not, even our federal government has reversed itself and said there is no woman who should be taking a calcium supplement, believe it or not. In fact, calcium supplements have been indicated as causing calcification in arteries and causing calcification in kidney stones rather than going into bone. 
as I wrote about in the longevity paradox, there's, and in the plant paradox, there's some pretty scary information that lectins, particularly in corn and soybeans, cause osteoporosis in chickens. And in fact, 10% of all chickens, even organic chickens, which are fed organic corn and soybeans, are lame at the time they're killed. And in fact, one of the reasons you have 100,000 chickens in a warehouse crammed up against each other is they actually hold each other up because they have so much osteoporosis in their bones. My wife Penny, who I mentioned before, a marathon runner, had osteopenia because she was eating a heavily grain-based runner's diet. When we stopped her doing these big runs and took away her grains, lo and behold, her osteopenia went away. And I see that in so many of my patients without giving them these horrible, quite frankly, bone-making compounds. So please, you'll get plenty of normal calcium in the leaves and vegetables that you eat. You don't need to supplement. But it's a great question. Okay, our next question from Becky.Frido is about exercise. After reading The Longevity Paradox, I'm trying to figure out how much I should be running. What do you recommend for weekly mileage? I feel good and st still stay young. I currently run about 20 to 25 miles a week. Okay, so let's divide by seven. That's uh, about three, maybe maximal four miles uh, per day. Uh, I do personally believe you should have one or two rest days in that sort of program. When we look at damage to heart muscle, and we can measure that with a very sensitive test um, called cardiac troponin I, it looks like for most of my patients, when they exceed about five miles of running, uh, and this is, you know, a reasonable clip, this is not, you know, a world-class athlete clip, that they begin to make, we can measure this myocardial damage. And when we ask them to back off on that distance, then they go back to normal. If you look at the literature, and there's now a lot of literature on ultra-marathoners, marathoners, even half-marathoners who do it chronically for their lives, they do damage the right ventricle of their heart and they get fibrosis of their heart. I've had several long-term, long-distance runners uh, who, unfortunately, you know, in my practice, have died of congestive heart failure from their right ventricle being working poorly. And they had normal coronaries. Um, so it's just a word of warning. Obviously, there are a lot of great ways to get endorphin manufacturing, and running was one of them. But just remember that Dr. Sheehan, one of the great fathers of running, died from metastatic prostate cancer. And the literature is full of long-distance runners who have died in the act of long-distance running. So. Three to five miles, knock your socks off. My dogs and I do about two and a half, three miles at a jog in hills every day. The good news about dogs is we have to take a break for you know, the potty stops and so I get to get a little rest, but that's perfectly fine. Uh, our next question is from SoCal, a rocker gal. Okay, what are your thoughts about the amino acid ergothionine? That seems to be the hot ingredient lately. Well, actually that's a compound, it's not an amino acid. It is a compound that is found in some mushrooms and I'm a big fan of it myself. I take a lot of mushroom supplements just to get ergothionine in me. The interesting thing is this is one of the few compounds that crosses the blood-brain barrier. And if you've read the literature recently, there's a very interesting study in humans out of Singapore that show that eating two cups of mushrooms per week, either cooked or raw, it doesn't matter, and two cups of cooked mushroom, if you take two cups of mushrooms and cook it, you will have a very small amount. Those people who ate, on average, two cups of mushrooms per week had a 90% reduction in Alzheimer's compared to people who did not do that. 
And you'll see in the longevity paradox that mushrooms and even mushroom broth has a huge place in the recipes. And that's because mushrooms are one of the richest sources of polyamines, these really cool compounds that promote longevity in every study that where they've ever been introduced. So get more mushrooms in your life. They're a great source of virgothionine. Um, yeah, good stuff. Alcohol, always a popular topic. Uh, and this comes from prep dress. What is the safest alcohol to drink besides red wine? I don't like red wine. Can I have white wine? Well, first of all, uh, the idea of all these things is try to not to negotiate. But uh, as you have probably read and seen in my pyramid, that there is a very interesting French study showing that the polyphenols in champagne in a study among French women lessened dementia and Alzheimer's in the champagne drinkers. Now, I mention this constantly because my wife uh, has that study attached to our uh, refrigerator door, and just last night we were talking about, with her, the health benefits of champagne. So I'll have my red wine, and she'll have a glass of champagne. Quite frankly, if you get champagne from the Pinot Noir grape, and a lot of champagnes are Pinot Noir based, or at least a blend, that was what the study was done. So do I think red wine is the best source of polyphenols that benefit health? Yes, but champagne may be a close second. If you're going to have white wine, please have white wine that was aged in oak barrels because you actually get the benefit of the oak polyphenols in the white wine. But so many white wines, particularly in this country, have been adulterated with sugar to make them more pleasing to the palate at the wine bar. And you just have to be aware that white wine, in general, will have a much higher sugar content than red wine. Uh, oh, and by the way, fun fact. Champagne is normally, at the final production, a small amount of sugar is added called the dosage. There are non-dosage champagnes, and quite frankly, we have a number that my wife uh, drinks because uh, we're trying to stay in ketosis most of our time. Okay, so the next question comes from one of my original big fans and a shout out to Lectin Free Mama, and thanks for sending this question in. I know you've come out against juicing in the past, but it is a time-honored tradition of cleansing and detoxing. If we choose organic yes list veggies, press it at home and pair it with fat to slow absorption, is there anything inherently bad about juicing as a form of detox? If so, what do you suggest instead? Well, you're gonna hear me in my letters talk about detoxing and how we, quite frankly, do it completely wrong. And I'm gonna have a lot to say about that, so stay tuned. However, the best part of juicing is being thrown away in terms of the pulp. The pulp is what feeds your friendly bacteria. So you've heard me say this over and over again, particularly with fruits, juice your fruits, throw the juice away, and then eat the pulp. And I think a Blendtec or a Nutribullet or a Magic Bullet or a Vitamix is a far better way to handle your vegetables than juicing. I really think you're throwing the best part of the plant away by juicing. And you, if you want to detox with vegetables, just use the whole thing. Now, you know, having said that, the juice, so many of the juices I see have been mixed with, oh, well, we're gonna throw the juice of an apple in, or we're gonna throw the juice of a cucumber in. And quite frankly, these are fruits, and all you're doing is getting a lot of sugar in your diet, and that's certainly not good for detoxing. But excellent question. Okay, here's a great question from Maddie underscore Mo. 
Is it safe for type 1 diabetics to fast slash do calorie restrictions? Any other tips for us type 1 diabetics wanting to live to 100 plus? So I, I take care of an NFL football player who is a type 1 diabetic. And I can tell you that he follows my ketogenic program to a T. He uh, routinely runs fasting blood sugars of 32 to 36 and plays competitive football. And I think as long as you can generate ketosis, not ketoacidosis, they're two totally different things, that you can successfully fast, intermittent fast, as a type 1 diabetic. And if you'd asked me that 20 years ago, I would have said, don't be ridiculous. But now that I am taking care of actually a number of type 1 diabetics, I'm very impressed that even you guys done properly can really fast and do ketosis safely. You have to obviously monitor yourself or have a physician monitor you. Uh, but with the new modern continuous glucose monitors and the modern ketosis monitors, I think it's absolutely one of the things you should introduce into your program to live to be 100 plus. Um, it's actually exciting times for type 1 diabetics. It really is. Uh, okay, our last question is from Ellie Chandler. Can we eat the skins of sweet potatoes, ginger, and turmeric? Hey, that's a great question. Um, believe it or not, the lectins uh, in tubers are actually out in the skin for the most part. So as a general rule, unless you're pressure cooking your sweet potatoes or turmeric or ginger, I'd rather you peel them or eat out the insides. Uh, I have a lot of patients that we do pressure cook uh, their yams and sweet potatoes because we found that a lot of people uh, are still sensitive to those lectins and tubers. And remember, even the tubers of plants, the plants really don't want you to eat their storage system. And so we got to get around their defense mechanisms. So just pressure cook them. It's really easy. Or uh, peel your turmeric and ginger. Okay. So that's all the time for questions we have today. You know, it's, it's great hearing from you. Keep sending them in. Stay tuned for more question and answer sessions like this in the coming months. It's actually one of our most popular podcasts. So you keep sending them in. I'll keep trying to answer them. So we'll see you next time and send them in because I'm Dr. Gundry and I'm always looking out for you. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.